Hey, welcome you guys to Impact. If you're a guest with us today, we're just so thankful that you chose to come and worship. Whatever got you here, if it's the website or a friend or family member, we're just glad you're here. We do ask one little thing of you. If you're sitting in one of the back rows or any of those rows, the chair right in front of you should have a, a card, a welcome card of some kind. If you want to take that, fill it out. Uh, let us know a little bit about who you are. You can take that to the Connect Center after our time here of worship is done. Uh, we got a little gift for you and just wanted to thank you for joining us today. Uh, we are in the middle of our Christmas series that we've entitled Missing Peace. Missing Peace. And we're going to get into that in just a second, but I wanted a little bit of participation right up front. I hope that's all right. Uh, just think about this question very quickly. Looking back on your childhood growing up, what was the greatest Christmas gift you ever received? Think about it. You got it? All right, tell somebody. Turn around, talk to somebody, let them know. Best Christmas gift you ever received. Come on, conversation. You guys are staring blankly. It may be next to your family. That's all right. Let them know what that gift was. Best Christmas gift you ever got. All right, we got it. We got it. Some of you guys still waiting for that best Christmas gift? Hopefully, yeah, okay. G give me some. Well, what are some of those that you guys shared? A trip to Hawaii? Man, I need to step up in my Christmas gift giving. That is amazing. What else? What's that? A dog. That is so very cool. What kind of dog? All right. Very nice. Do you still have it? No. Did it die? Oh, man. That's just depressing. How, what, where am I going with this? Terrible. What else? What other gifts? A, a, an easy bake oven. I remember those. Those were good. I didn't know how to use them, but I remember them. Any other good gifts here? Me. You? You? Oh, James. Bye, James. Yes. <laughs> the gift is you're leaving. That's good. What else? Any other gifts? Uh, I like the PlayStation 1. Okay. All right. Now we're getting real. This is good. Best gifts. Yeah, I had some people say a, a child. That's a pretty good Christmas gift. Uh, other people said marriage. So you had people proposing on, on Christmas Day. They'd seen one too many Hallmark movies, I guess. Uh, that's what happens. Luke, that was you, right? Right on. Yeah, we, we have different things that we'll give and receive during the season. And, and you know, it's a fun part of, of the season, isn't it? A fun part of Christmas. It's a great part of, of the experience of, of everything that we look forward to during Christmas time. But guys, here's the thing. Something that is a great part of Christmas should not become the ultimate part of Christmas. And not just the ultimate part of Christmas, but the ultimate part of our lives. This series that we're going through entitled Missing Peace, we've been taking a look together at, at how many times you and I, uh, during this season in particular, feel so overwhelmed and so stressed because we have removed Christ from his rightful place in our lives and put something else at center. Christmas is a time where we are celebrating the birth of Jesus Christ, the incarnation, the son of God stepping into the world. And one of his names or monikers is the Prince of Peace. When the angels came and heralded his birth, they proclaimed peace on earth not just to the world, but to each and every one of us individually. And so it is tragically ironic that on the, the time where we celebrate the birth of the Prince of Peace, it's for many of us the most stressful, overwhelming time of the year. How do we recapture the peace that Christ came to bring? Last week, we talked a little bit about how to start thinking about the different components of our lives. Because we all have responsibilities. We have family relationships, we have friendships, we have work responsibilities. Some of us have school. We have all these different things that are parts of our lives and they're all there overwhelming us and crushing us. And so we try to prioritize, don't we? We, we try to make this list. Okay, God, you need to be first and then maybe my family and then my work responsibilities and it goes from there. The problem with our priority list is that we move from one to the next. And when we're in the second one, we no longer really think about the first one. It is compartmentalized, but life is not like that, is it? It all touches on, uh, on itself and touches together and it's all intertwined. So a better way of thinking it, as we discussed last week, is to think about our, our solar system. Think about the sun at the center and the planets revolving around it. And each planet can represent a different facet of our lives. The key is not to prioritize Jupiter over Saturn. The key is to keep the sun center. That center of our soul system where every other part of our life revolves around Christ. When the sun or if the sun was removed from the center of our solar system, what would happen? We would all die immediately. Every planet would go into itself and collapse upon one another and everything, life as we knew it, would be destroyed. 
So many of us live every day with things out of balance, out of whack, where we put something else at center. We put ourselves or, or time, busyness, uh, schedules, and many other things at center, which is what results in the stress and disharmony of the season and of our lives. Last week, we talked about schedule and busyness and, and how to put Christ back at the center of our plans. Today, as you can see with the manger scene behind us, we're going to be talking about something a little bit different. I don't know if you noticed on the way in, but the nativity's up here. It looks beautiful, but something's a little bit out of place. Something is in the manger that shouldn't be there. Did you guys notice that? You see a whole lot of toys and technology and gadgets. And for many of us, stuff has become the focal point of Christmas. Material possessions, things, money. And it's part of our sinful human nature is to take things and make them central to our lives. Jesus recognized this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. He actually speaks to his followers and says, you cannot serve two masters. You're either going to love the one and hate the other, or you're going to love this one and hate the other. He said, you can only serve God. You cannot serve God and mammon. Now, the word mammon in the Greek means not just money and finances, currency. It means material goods of all kinds. It's the stuff that we tend to focus on. And for many of us, it's not just during Christmas. It's throughout the year. The number one source of conflict for most couples before they get married, during that dating and engagement period, you know what the number one source of stress and conflict is? Money. After they get married and extending even decades into their marriage, you know what the number one source of conflict is? Money. Nothing changes. Marriage changes nothing. Likewise, Christmas changes nothing. Christmas doesn't take financial stress away. Can I hear an amen? amen? In fact, it amplifies it, doesn't it? It takes all of the stress that we already feel, paying bills, watching that checking account balance go down day after day, and it simply creates it and makes it worse. Because now we have to get gifts and get everything people are wanting, and it can be overwhelming. All too often, we put mammon and things in Christ's rightful place. We make this season about it. Why did Jesus warn against it? It's because we look to material possessions and finances far too often. We look to those for everything we should only be looking to God for. We want to receive our, our, our safety, our sense of security and stability, our, our hope for the future, our, our sense of, of provision, our happiness at any given moment. We look to things for that instead of looking to those things for the only true source of hope in life, which is Christ himself. And that's why Jesus gives that warning. How do we move Christ back to center? That's what we want to talk about today. I want to do a quick plug for one of the tables you'll see out front. Part of our winter groups launch that's happening in January that I hope you're a part of, by the way. Here at Impact, we are all about community. Uh, that is our desire. We believe that, that, that this Christian life is not just about what we do here on Sunday mornings. Are you in agreement with that? This is a great part of discipleship and what it means to follow Christ, worshiping together and learning from his word. But we also believe that discipleship happens best in genuine biblical community where you are known by others and they know you. Sometimes we can slip in and out of church here on Sunday and no one even knows the difference. But when it comes to community, who is your spiritual family that encourages you and supports you? That's our heart, and we hope you take that step to enter into community. So we have our big groups launched, a 10-week commitment where you can uh, sign up for an impact group or a men's or women's study, a, a marriage group, and, and have that kind of encouragement. But one of the groups we're offering in January is Financial Peace University. And the whole idea is, is to study the Word of God together. It's this curriculum that Dave Ramsey put together that some of us in here desperately need to reestablish the foundation of biblical principle and biblical practice when it comes to the monies God has entrusted to us. And so if you're drowning, if you're stressed out, if you're losing sleep because of your financial situation, if your marriage and other relationships are suffering to some degree because of the tension financially in your home, if you are dealing with physical manifestations of stress because of that, you need peace. You need to go and, and, and say, God, how do I need to change my life and, and my approach to finances? So please do take advantage and stop by that table afterwards. I'm going to get into Matthew chapter 2 here. Matthew chapter 2, and I'm start reading in verse 1. And we're going to learn from the example of some, some very wise men 
uh, that the, the Christmas story reveals to us. I want to start, though, with this great quote by, by the wonderful theologian named Dr. Seuss. In his book, The Grinch, maybe you've seen the movie, but he ends the, sta- the, the, the story this way. Maybe Christmas doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more. Let's talk about the little bit more it means. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men, or magi, from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him and assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. Was that his intention? Absolutely not. He wanted to get rid of him. Verse nine, after listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream, not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. And I want to talk a bit about the Magi, these wise men who came to Christ in the Nativity. First of all, we know that that, that most often these Magi are placed at the birth of Christ, at the scene, in the manger. We see here a Nativity that's got some silhouettes behind us and and a dude with a crown. See behind me? But what we, if we studied the Christmas story at all, you may be aware that the Magi were not at the the manger scene, at the nativity itself. In fact, they probably didn't step onto the scene here in Matthew 2 until Jesus was upwards of two years old. And we know this for a couple of reasons. Number one, we read in verse 11 that the Magi entered the house, not the barn or the stable where Christ was born, but into the the house that, that, that he lived in in Nazareth or in Bethlehem. And then we know also that that for a uh, uh, t- couple of years, uh, there, there were uh, uh, rumors of, of the Messiah being born and that Herod, uh, when he heard about the Christ child's birth, uh, gave an order later in Matthew chapter two. What was the order? To have them all killed. And he specifically said, after ascertaining what time uh, the star appeared and when the Messiah or the Christ child was born, he, he ordered that every male child two years old and younger be murdered. And so we know that that was a basic time frame. And so that's what we know about the timeline. Um, The rest of what we know is very sketchy, but we make some assumptions here. Uh, Traditionally, we believe there were three magi, and we do that because of the gifts that they gave. But the actual number is unknown. There could have been 3,000 for all that we know. We don't know how many there were. Most likely, uh, they came from the region of Persia, and they were very familiar with the prophetic writings of both Daniel and the prophet Balaam, who spoke to win the Christ was going to be born. Church history actually gives the Magi names. Maybe you've heard these, Caspar, Melchior, and Balthazar. And we know for sure that their ability to discern the stars and their extensive nature of this expedition that they went on to find the Christ suggests they were very wealthy and had great resources and funds to be able to, to, to go and just leave everything and go seek him out. We also know that they were wise and educated uh, in their understanding of astronomy and the stars. And, and we can assume that they were men of, of, of influence and power in their region, which is why they're often referred to as the three kings who came to seek out Christ. But all of this, to be honest, is really kind of speculative. We can make assumptions, but the things that we know for certain that are revealed to us is number one, why they came, and number two, what they brought with them. And that's what I want to talk about today. The first is why they came. They told Herod why they were there. 
They left no mystery to it. They said, we have come to find and to worship the King of the Jews, the Christ child. They came to worship Jesus Christ. And this is very significant that this group of Gentiles with all of their wealth and power and influence, risked it all and left it all behind so they could come and see and worship the Christ. They had him at center of their thoughts, of their future planning, of their money and finances, of their lives. And we can learn from their example. Far too often we lose sight of Christ's rightful place. And even as we come to worship him, we worship in song, but not with our lives. How can we follow the example of the Magi? What did they do that we can learn and glean from? First of all, I want to make observation here. They didn't just come to sing some songs to baby Jesus, did they? They came to worship, but they also came to offer him or present to him gifts. What were the gifts? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they're known for those gifts. But the point is they came to give to Christ. When it comes to this whole issue of keeping Christ at center of our lives, specifically pertaining to things, material possessions, and the money God has entrusted to us, the way that we ensure he remains at center and we don't place mammon or money at center is by consistently giving to him as he has called us to give. If you've been around church at all, you're you're gonna inevitably hear about giving. It's something that we do. Pastor James got up and said, hey, as a part of our worship, we're gonna receive our, our, our tithes and our offerings. It's a way that we worship. And for some, it can be kind of confusing. What is this all about? Well, it's about many things. But one of the primary things is understanding God's heart for us and why he calls us to give. God does not want and he does not need your money. So we can all breathe a huge sigh of relief, right? What he wants is our hearts free from the love of money. Because he knows when we are tethered to money for our hope and our sense of security that our lives get out of whack. It becomes destructive to us. And so giving is a way to sever that cord of attachment to wealth and to reattach it where it should be all along, which is to Christ. Giving regularly removes money from center and puts it in its rightful place. And this is especially important during the Christmas season. As you are not alone, those of you who dread Christmas to some degree, because of the financial strain it puts in your life. Because you got to keep paying the bills. You still got to eat. Still got to pay the utilities. Still got to put gas in your car. And you're already struggling to do that month after month. And here comes Christmas and just adds to it, doesn't it? It increases the financial strain. And so the tendency is to focus so much on what we don't have and what we feel like we we have to get for everybody that it becomes the central focus of our lives. Consistently giving even during these times, this is what ensures Jesus doesn't go anywhere. That that he stays where he's supposed to be as that central figure of our life and during this season. Giving forces finances into their proper place as a part of our life that revolves around Christ, our only true source of hope and happiness and life. 1 Timothy 6, the Apostle Paul writes this, verse 9. Those who desire to be rich fall into temptation into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and what? Destruction. You guys can speak up. And what? Destruction. Yeah, you got to say that with authority. Destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Notice he never writes, money is the root of all evil. He says the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. See, Jesus knows how he has made us. And he knows when we place stuff in the central place of our lives, that things begin to unravel. That's when we begin to feel the stress and weight of of an unhealthy life and, and, and rhythm. In fact, there's ruin and destruction and people find themselves wandering away from faith in Christ, not trusting him for provision as we should. When it comes to this area of our life, most of us would have to admit 
that we have a little bit more in common with Herod than we'd like. Uh, Think about it. Herod was not too thrilled about the news of a new king coming into the scene, was he? What was Herod's response? He was greatly troubled. He was the man in power. He was the, the head honcho in the area. The only really challenge to his authority in that area would have been the Roman emperor himself who was living in Rome and wasn't going to be caught dead over in Palestine. And so he had full rule and reign. He was incredibly wealthy, did what he wanted, how he wanted to do it. He would build these extravagant things and buildings and temples just to be able to have his legacy secured. And so we see in Herod someone who had great power and he wanted to keep it. He was upset by the idea of a king of the Jews because he did not want his control threatened. And for some of us, many of us, in fact, we come to Christ, we give our lives to him, we ask him to take control, but when it comes to the area of our finances and and the material possession end of things, we don't want to release control. We want to be the one that makes the decisions. What's interesting is it's not just Herod that was upset, but we read that all of Jerusalem was upset or troubled with him. Did you ever wonder why that is? I mean, these are God's people, the Jewish people. If they hear there's a king of the Jews who could possibly overthrow the the Roman appointed king, wouldn't that be good news? And yet all of Jerusalem was also very troubled. Like the people of Israel, we can get very used to a particular way of life. We get comfortable with it and we don't want to see change. Even if it's changed for the better, we don't like it. Anybody here hate change? I mean, we change the service times. You're like, oh, I can't handle this. We were used to going at 1030. We like 10 o'clock. That was perfect. And they just messed it all up. Any kind of change. We could uh, just kind of reconfigure the chairs a little bit or, or move things around. And this is your seat. This is your seat in church. You can come in and someone's sitting in your seat and you just lose it. Because any kind of change is upsetting and unsettling to you. Yeah, the people of Israel had grown accustomed to Herod's rule. And so even though it could have brought promise, they still were upset by it because they just had gotten used to the way things were. Some of us have gotten used to a certain way of life when it comes to possessions, when it comes to spending, when it comes to giving and receiving during Christmas, when it comes to our life style, and we don't want things to change. But guys, I want you to hear this today. This is a promise to you. You ready? Jesus will mess up your normal. He will. It's not an if, it's a when. When you give your life to him, he will mess up your normal. He will mess up your normal way of thinking, of acting, of living, even when it comes to things and money. He's going to change it. And for many of us, that's our prayer. Jesus, change me, make me more like you. I hope that's our prayer. But how can we expect Jesus to change us without changing our lifestyle, without changing how we see things and how we interact with our world? And that extends into every area, even when it comes to money and finance. Yet how many of us still expect God to simply bless, and yet we can keep living the way that we've wanted to live and always have lived in years past? 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5, Paul speaks about, as he describes, people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. In other words, Paul says there are certain Christians who think that because they came to Christ and gave their lives to him, that their godliness and their righteousness is going to benefit them financially. And we know people like this. Maybe we've been those people at times past. God, I'm I'm faithful. I'm going to church. I'm reading my Bible. I'm praying. I talk to people about you. And so you know the deal. Now I need to get rich. Now you need to get me a better car. You need to upgrade my home. I want a pool. I've always wanted a pool. Come on, Lord, make it happen. Bring that promotion. And we have this idea that godliness equates to great gain monetarily or materially. But Paul brings clarity, verse 6. He says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world. We cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. 
As the world says, the one who has the most is the wealthiest person. But Jesus says the one who needs the least is the wealthiest person. You see the paradigm shift? We have to change the way we treat things. If we want to experience peace, not just during the Christmas season, but throughout our lives, our entire understanding of stuff and money and finance needs to change. Jesus will ruin your normal. He will call you to consider every dollar that he has entrusted to you and to ask, Lord, what do you want me to do with this? Because that is biblical stewardship, caring for that which belongs to him. He will call you to live more simply in order to give more extravagantly. He will call you to, to give more than you're even really comfortable giving. He's going to take you past that boundary. We've all got boundaries of obedience we feel pretty decent about. And Lord, this is where I'm comfortable. I'm gonna go ahead and give this. And Jesus says, great, that's your starting point. Now grab my hand and let me take you where I want you to go. And he's going to unsettle and unnervous. That's who he is and what he came to do. That's what the story of the rich young ruler is all about. You guys, remember the rich young ruler in the gospels? He came to Jesus, a wealthy young man, and, and he said, Lord, I wanna follow you. I want eternal life. How do I get it? And Jesus said, well, you know, keep the commandments. You know the commandments, keep them. And the young man responds and says, well, I've, I've done that since I was a youth. I've always kept the commandments. So what else do I need to do? Jesus said, okay, well, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything that you own, everything. Not just 10%. We're not talking a tithe here. Give everything to the poor and then come, you'll have treasure in heaven and you can follow me. And we read that the young man went away saddened and disheartened because he was very wealthy and he was unwilling to let go of what God had called him to let go of. And this is what we do. We hold so tightly to what we feel we want and need that as God is trying to bring blessing to our lives, literally pouring these blessings down, we can't grab hold of them because they don't look like we want them to look. Sometimes they're wrapped in pain. They're wrapped in hardship and trial, maybe even risk where we're not comfortable and not experiencing the luxuries that we want to experience. And so we hold tightly to what we have and just say, no, I got to hold on to it and cling to it. And in the process, everything just keeps bouncing right off and we can't grab hold of what he has for us. Guys, the only solution is through giving to open our hands and say, Lord, it's all yours. Take whatever you want. I mean, because you know better than I do. And if I'm holding on to something that's going to keep me from, from what I need that you want to give me, take it and put in my life and my hands whatever you have for me. That's the essence of, of giving and what it's about. I don't know if you guys ever played the game growing up. <clears throat> we actually have it back here. That worked out well. Monopoly. Anybody ever played Monopoly growing up? Yeah, was this a favorite for anybody? Anybody almost get divorced because of this game? I know a lot of people that would get in major fights and arguments with their spouse. It can get intense. But I love starting to play this game with my kids. They, they love it now. They'll play it even without me. But uh, when we first started playing, I, I, I thought it was a great teaching moment for all of them because kids all have a tendency to do the exact same thing. They have the same favorite part of the game every time. You know what it is? When you're handing out the money. When you're given the $500 bills that don't even exist, but they look awesome. When, when you have the hundreds and you have the little stack of 20s and a couple 50s and, and you start distributing the money, that's every kid's favorite part, isn't it? Because they love getting the money and having it. It's the closest thing to money they've ever seen. And the kids all do the same thing before they learn how to play the game. They'll roll the dice and they'll land on a property and they'll come up with, ooh, Pennsylvania Avenue. That's the green property. We know that's a good one. Green is in cash money, right? And they get the green property and they'll go, okay, yeah, I want to buy it. How much is it? And I'll say, oh, it's like $320. Oh. Um, and I can see their little wheels spinning as they're looking at their precious money and then looking at this piece of property and they don't really get it. So they don't want to lose this. And so what do they say? That's okay. I don't want to buy it. I'm just going to keep my money. Now, if you've ever played Monopoly, you know, if you try to keep your money, what is going to happen? You will lose it. 
Anyone who hoards the cash and doesn't secure property is going to lose whatever cash they have because you have to roll, you have to keep playing, you have to keep living. And the goal is to get property. Dad teaches them that by demolishing them in Monopoly every chance I get. I don't care that you're three, you're gonna learn this lesson. And so I will purchase all the property, I'll buy it all up, and they're like, Dad, you don't have any money. Oh, just wait. I can mortgage the property if I need to. I can do any number of things with it. Y'all are gonna be owing me a ton of cash once I build my houses and hotels. I will own you. And they learn that game very, very quickly. Monopoly is about investment. It's about releasing what you have now in order to secure something you have that that will secure the future and provide for that future. And we all get the concept of investment, but guys, we've got to grow up in our thinking spiritually. We have to look past even this life into eternity. Because when this life ends, there's still rewards to be reaped. And Jesus tells us about it in Matthew chapter 6, 19. He says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal. And I might add, where 401ks are dependent on the government. But lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. Jesus says it's about investing there. Not in the last 10, 15, 20 years of our lives here on this earth. That's how we keep Christ center. It's how we experience the peace that we have been missing in the area of our finances. And guys, I am so grateful that I'm a part of a church family filled with people who understand this who faithfully invest in the kingdom of God. When they, they would love to have a little bit of extra cash, especially during the Christmas season, but they understand, no, it's not about that. If God blesses me with more so that I can give more. And because of that, the ministry and mission of this local church family has been something that, that has been just a privilege to be a part of. You know, this last year in 2018, we were able to baptize 28 people as followers of Christ. That's a big deal, isn't it? In fact, there is no bigger deal. That's what this is all about. And we can get so caught up in all these other things, but the only win is discipleship. It's making Christ followers. And when someone not only just raises a hand, but stands and says, I want to be baptized so the world will know I'm a follower of Jesus, that is what this is about. We have hundreds that are experiencing biblical community, sharing life with one another and growing together in Christ through impact groups and men's and women's and marriage studies. We've got our our youth group and our kids ministry that that is continuing to grow and sharing the gospel with our young people. This past summer, we had 130 kids at Vacation Bible School, some of them hearing the gospel for the first time. Now we usually average around 115 to 120 kids every single Sunday. You can be praying for our kids workers because that's what's going on next door. Celebrate recovery has been able to encourage those struggling with not only addiction, but all kinds of hurts and habits and hangups. We have a new ASL ministry, sign language, that's, that's able to share and communicate God's word to those that are hearing impaired. That's during third service, by the way, if you know someone who's in need of that. But it's not just what God's doing in our church, it's through our church. This last year, we gave more than 5,000 pounds of food to those who are hungry and in need here in our community. You know where that food came from? You, the people of God, the church here at Impact. We've been able to give thousands of dollars to those who are in need in this church family, people that needed food themselves, that were worried about their utility bills uh, being uh, so overdue they couldn't pay them and, and their air conditioning being shut off in the middle of our summer here in Menifee. And that's not a pretty picture. And we were able to help pay those utilities, even cover funeral expenses for someone who couldn't otherwise afford it. Again, we were able to do that because of the faithfulness of this church family. Last year, we were able to give $32,000 to support the work of our missionaries throughout the world. Cambodia, Zambia, Africa, and the orphanage there with Breath of Heaven. Haiti Endowment Fund and the ministry there that that is is, is numerous and all kinds of things, from medical clinics to pastors training to investing in young people. You name it, they're doing it. Incredible ministry. 
Even here in our local school campuses through Student Venture, $32,000 able to support the work of God through those ministries. And that doesn't even include the above and beyond stuff, like the chairs you just heard the praise report on. Ted Lawler coming in saying, we need chairs for our new church. Impact saying, got it, and taking care of it. Even the boxes maybe you saw out front, I think they're still set up out there, uh, but we've been collecting care packages to be able to bless the homeless in this valley. And we're gonna go distribute those right after we end our time here. That's possible because of the faithfulness of his church, because you understand this principle of kingdom investment. I know that there's a common objection as we read stories like the rich young ruler, as we look to the examples of, of even the magi, and the objection is, okay, so, so I'm just supposed to like, what, give everything away? I just give it all away and then, then what? So I give it all away and then I have nothing and then I just starve and I'm out on the street and I die. Is that what's supposed to happen? Okay. Let me speak to this just, just very, very quickly here. Number one, why do we insist on going to an extreme in order to justify the fact we just don't want to do something? Do you know what I mean by this? Let me give you another example. My wife comes to me and says, Ryan, I, I really need some help around the house. And my response is, fine, I'll just quit my job. I'm gonna, just going to quit everything, have no other relationships or friendships in life. I'm not going to do anything but just be here at your beck and call to clean the house and do everything that needs to be done and fix everything that needs to be fixed. I'll have no life, no money I'll make. I'll, I'll do nothing. And you know what? We're going we're gonna to lose the house because I can't even afford it anymore. And we're going to end up on the street and we're going to starve and we're all going to die. <laughs> and my wife says, Ryan, I just wanted you to take out the trash. <laughs> we do that though, don't we? We push it to an extreme so we feel better about the fact that we just don't want to do it. But you know, on the, on the other side of that, can you imagine giving so much so much of yourself and your things away in obedience to the Lord saying, God, you've called me to do this. You give so much that you actually die and you come into the presence of God. Oops. <laughs> Jesus, I gave so much that I died and I'm here with you. Wouldn't that be the way to go? I can't think of a better way to come into his presence. That would be awesome. So you have no excuse, got it? None of us. I completely derailed. Where am I? Okay, here we go. The example of the Magi gives us something also very tangible. I want to close with this, which means no more than another hour or so. <laughs> the Magi are known for the gifts that they gave. The example of worship and keeping Christ at center by giving to him consistently as we need to do. But the nature of their gifts is also telling. What it reveals to us is that we're also called as we give to others to give to them intentionally. To consider how we are giving and why we are giving and to do it as God has called us to. Let me explain what I mean here. The gifts that the Magi gave were gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. Keep in mind that Jesus at this time was probably one to two years old. Do you know any one to two year olds that would really love to have their own stash of gold and frankincense and myrrh? Toddlers' minds are on some other things, aren't they? And this is hard for us to grasp. We kind of neglect the humanity portion of Christ. It's hard for us to really wrap our mind around. This whole idea that he was fully God, yet also fully man. That means he was a two year old, a toddler, running around, little saggy whatever version of Nazareth diapers were at the time. And he wanted things as a toddler, I'm sure, that were far different than gold and frankincense and myrrh. These wise men came to Jesus, but they offered him gifts that meant more than just making him happy in any given moment. The gold was a gift for kings. And in this gift, they declared that he was not only the prince of peace, but the king of kings. The frankincense was, was something used to, to place on the altar as an act of worship and sacrifice and the priest would offer it in the temple. And through this gift, they were declaring that Christ was our great high priest that made our relationship with God right again. And not only that, but he was the one worthy to be worshiped. 
Myrrh was used in the embalming of dead bodies, preparing them for burial. And in giving this gift of myrrh, they were declaring he would be the one that died for the sin of the world so that we could be forgiven and have life. These gifts were significant, not because they were what toddler Jesus asked for, but because they spoke about who he was. We need to be better about how we give. We need to be more intentional. We need to think past just whatever their wish list might be. And we get them from our kids and maybe from our spouse and friends and it happens. When you really stop and think about how many things we've purchased, gone into debt to get, and bought for another person that end up in a pile in some corner of a closet, that end up in a garage sale, that end up on a garage sale, or on any other offer up or Facebook marketplace site, it's kind of discouraging, isn't it? We spend so much and it just gets set aside. And, and we do the same as people give to us. There's wear and tear and it doesn't mean as much as it did initially. The gifts the Magi brought Jesus had nothing to do with what he wanted. They had everything to do with who he was as our King of Kings and great high priest and sacrifice, what would the gift portion of Christmas look like if you and I gave and received things that focused on who someone is, not just what they wanted? How would it change? How would it change our budget to actually step back and say, Jesus, what have you called me to give to these people? I know what they're asking for, but what do you want me to give? We don't pray about that. We just hear what they want and try to get it and even go into debt to make it happen. But to step back and say, Lord, this is what they're wanting, but what do you want them to have? And to make the gifts about who they are and about who Christ is making them. To answer the question I asked you all before we started today, my response to the greatest gift I've ever received from my childhood, I think back to when I was 13 years old. And that past summer, I had gone to a little Christian camp and conference and, and the faith of my father and the faith of my mother that I had been raised with became my own during that camp. And I had an encounter with the Lord and he was real and, and I gave my life to him and, and I got so fired up about knowing Jesus more. And my parents saw that and they, they saw what God was doing in my life. And so that Christmas, they gave me a gift that was not the most expensive, but meant more than anything else they could have purchased. They got me my first grown-up Bible. And I could finally do away with my precious moments Bible. <laughs> they gave me this Bible that was a study Bible, New American Standard Version, a Ryrie study Bible. And it was so cool because I knew it was the same Bible my dad used. And I saw my dad with that bad boy open every single day. I was like, Lord, I've arrived. <laughs> it meant so much to me. And meaning even more was the fact that they heard from the Lord and took time to grab a pen and on the inside cover of that Bible inscribe a message to me as their son. Telling me that they were proud of me and who they knew God had made me to be and never to forget who he was making me. And I, I gotta tell you today, guys, there were so many moments throughout my life where I struggled. And I went through hard times and difficult things, emotionally, physically, all kinds of stuff. And, and when I'd go through those times, even seasons of sin and failure and shame, the Lord would bring me to his word. But there were even times where I felt a, a guilt just reading because I knew I wasn't where I needed to be but then he'd bring me back to my parents' messages. That was just his word in a new way through them. And I have them memorized. I can't forget them. And they've been with me throughout my entire life. And they're not the words of God. Please hear me. There's, there's no comparison. But they were so significant to me and helped me through such difficult times. We need to be more intentional with our gifts to ask the Lord what it is he's called us to give instead of just getting everything on the list. And on the flip side of that, parents in particular, there are times where we get things for our children and even for friends and for family members 
that can actually have a negative effect on who they are and who they're becoming. And we don't intentionally do that. We get them what they want, and in getting them what they want, we inadvertently give them things they should never have. How often do we as parents get at Christmas time for our children the gift of apathy and laziness wrapped in a Nintendo Switch? How often do we give our children social dysfunction and a window to sexual temptation by giving them their smartphone at a much too young age? Do we give them a sense of entitlement like the world owes me for existing by going into debt every year to make sure we get them everything their little heart desires? I know any kids in here today are like, Pastor, shut up. But this is something we need to talk about, isn't it? As parents, you know this. There are times where even when it comes to Christmas, we need to look at the list and say, guys, this is great, this is great. These things here, no. We're not doing that. And here's why we're not doing that. These things aren't bad. Please hear that. This is not an anti-Nintendo Switch message. It's simply saying, have you asked the Lord about it? Have you asked him what the implications are for your kids, for your siblings, for your spouse, for your friends? Is it going to do damage to who they are or is it a part of what God has for them and for their lives at this time? We need to give better. We need to give wisely as the Magi have demonstrated and, and say, Lord, what is your plan? Because that's the heart of God. It's who he was, who he is, and what he did for us. Even when you look at the gift, the greatest gift we have ever received, the gift of his son. He did not give us what we wanted. You know, his people at the time, when it came to the Messiah, they were hoping for a political revolutionary to overthrow the Roman Empire to free them from Roman oppression and bondage. And God said, no, that's not what you need. I'm gonna send my son and he is going to be the suffering servant. And he's going to show you what a life surrendered to me looks like. And he is going to die on a cross so that you can be freed, not from Rome, but from sin. So that you can be forgiven and changed because that is your greatest need. And it's who I am making you as my people. We need to follow his example. His example. 